Father, thank you for fathers. And thank you, Father, that in your revelation to us through the word and in the person of Jesus Christ, you've given us an example of what loving fathers do for their children. In the spiritual sense, as you father us, you show us love unconditionally. You give us boundaries for our good. You bring us discipline when we need it. But you bring all these things to good in the end so that we may be brought up to reflect who you are, to share in your holiness. May us, as human fathers, mimic all of these traits, Father. Give us the strength and the courage to do that. And with the mothers alongside, Father, we would, as parents, show godliness in our homes so that our children might reflect it when they leave. Thank you for a church, Father, that makes that a possibility with the word in front of us and praise and prayer all around us and the gifts and the talents of so many serving. And now, Father, take us through your word. Take, it through, take us through it in truth. Take us through it in humility so that we may reflect on what it teaches. And take us through it through the power of your spirit so that it may change us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the conspiracy of Rebecca and Jacob has done its work in chapter 27 of Genesis. They have convinced Isaac through deception that Jacob was Esau. And in that way, Jacob received the blessing, which means that in the end, the birthright was honored. The one who owned it did, in fact, receive it. Jacob will now have all of his father's inheritance. Jacob didn't just get the double portion that the birthright normally would allot. No, Isaac foolishly assigned his entire inheritance to Jacob, thinking he was giving it to Esau. Now, that may not be a fact that's clear enough to you and I for the time we've already spent in the chapter. This may be something you hadn't noted, but it will become clear enough as we look through the rest of the chapter today that the blessing we saw given last week, spoken to Jacob, was a blessing of the entire inheritance of Isaac. Isaac thought he was outsmarting Rebekah and Jacob. He thought he was even outsmarting God, if you will, because he must have reckoned that he could allocate everything that he had to his favorite son, to Esau, and in doing so, settle the matter and take the issue out of God's hands. But instead, as we know, he did exactly the opposite. He did the opposite of what he wanted, which was exactly what God said would be. Proving again the point we've been making here time and time again, that God, by his sovereignty, will always get what he wants, even if, and in fact, usually, working through the sin of men. Isaac's attempt to outmaneuver God and outsmart God reminds me of a classic exchange of a young boy in prayer to God. And the boy begins by saying, God, how long is a million years to you? And through the Spirit, he receives an answer immediately. God says, it is but a second, Johnny. Johnny's a bit taken back that he's getting these answers. So he thought, well, we need to pursue this conversation a little bit. He says, well, God, how much is a million dollars to you? And God responds, it is but a penny to me, Johnny. So then Johnny had a bright idea. Johnny says, God, can I have a penny? God said, just a second. (laughs) You can't outsmart God. So now it's time to watch the other shoe drop, because now we've got to watch what Esau gets as he comes into the tent shortly after Jacob has left with the blessing. Verse 30 is where we pick up, chapter 27. Now, it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. Isaac, his father, said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently. And said, who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also. Oh, my father. It's a dramatic moment, and it's one where obviously Isaac never expected To see this happen. He never expected a second visitor. For all we know, he was half asleep. And then unexpectedly, the second son pops into the tent, bringing the food and asking for the blessing. What Isaac's reaction tells us instantly is that Isaac had no intention 
of granting a blessing to Rebekah's son, to Jacob. Remember, from Isaac's point of view, he just blessed Esau. And had he been doing it in the proper way that the culture anticipated, he would have then proceeded to further bless the rest of his family. This would have been an event in which all the sons were given their respective inheritance in one moment. The very fact that Isaac is surprised at the prospect of a second son walking in confirms for us that his intentions were not honest, that his intention was to sneak around the other family members and assign everything to Esau without anyone knowing. So when Isaac hears Esau announce himself, he's surprised. Notice the description Esau uses of himself. Esau says, it is I, Esau, your firstborn, emphasizing again that he is the one who's supposed to receive this blessing. Now, he might have been the first child born physically, but in terms of the birthright, and that's the context we're in here, the conversation is about the birthright. In that context, Esau is not the firstborn. He sold that to Jacob. He's walked in to claim something that he has no rights to, and he's continuing to, to proffer to Isaac, to his father, that he has this right, which he does not. So his description in this context is a lie. It implies he has something that he does not have. So when Esau announces himself, Isaac responds here by trembling. Now, the word tremble in Hebrew is sharad, and it literally is translated great fear, trembling in fear, not in anger. And that's an important distinction because we have to get in the head of Isaac in this moment. What reaction is Isaac having emotionally to the prospect, to the knowledge that he just blessed the wrong son? He's not furious at the deception. He's exceedingly fearful here because he recognizes that God has been working his plan in the midst of Isaac's disobedience. This is a man who just recognized that he entered into a contest of wills with the living God and God just won in a big way. And that response, that recognition just brought out of Isaac the fear of God. Trembling in fear, knowing God's wrath, knowing his judgment and appreciating that he just got caught in the biggest mistake of his life. There's a time in Second Chronicles where King Jehoshaphat, who if you don't know, he's one of the good kings. He said this. In 2 Chronicles 19, 7, he said, Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do. For the Lord our God will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or the taking of a bribe. Be careful what you do. Do what you do in the fear of the Lord, knowing that your God is not going to participate and support and work with you or me if our endeavor is an unrighteous endeavor, if our desire is to show partiality, to take a bribe, in other words, to be deceptive, to be ungodly, we do that on our own. And we do that with whatever consequences may come. That's the emotional, spiritual response Isaac just had to getting caught. He knows that there's only one way all of what just transpired could have come about. Only if God was involved in informing Rebecca and making opportunity available and causing it all to play out just the way it did. It's not coincidence. It's God. Because Isaac also remembers God had said Jacob would get the blessing. Now that he sees it happen, despite his best efforts to stop it, he can only make one conclusion. And as the reality of that moment sets in, Isaac is horrified. Look at what he now has to confront. Not only his disobedience to God and God's showing of that disobedience, of his revealing of it to Isaac, but he also now has to deal with the fact that he just blessed the son he didn't want with his entire inheritance. And more than that, he gave him the patriarchal authority. He said, your sons, your mother's sons will bow down to you. Your brothers, in other words, will be servants to you. Indeed, that person will be blessed. Isaac is saying, I can't change this. Isaac has given away the farm and he is now left flat footed with no opportunity to recover. So when Esau hears this story, Esau immediately realizes the seriousness of the situation. His response, though, is completely different than his father's. They're both emotional, but they're different in where they're centered in the heart of what they mean. We've already established that Isaac was fearful because he respects and knows the Lord and having been caught, he's, he's something like a young child who's been caught with their hands in the cookie jar. Their response is not anger at being caught. They're fearful. They should be. 
Esau's cry is different. It is bitter, we're told, and sorrowful. He is suddenly very sad at the prospect of having no inheritance whatsoever. And in desperation, he appeals to his father. He asks him, can you give me something, Dad? What he means is there is some portion of your inheritance surely you held back. Surely you didn't give it all away, did you? He was clearly shaken by the prospect of having nothing. And so once again here, we see evidence that Isaac's blessing to Jacob was total and complete. It left nothing behind. Now, why did Esau get so upset? And I asked that question because of something we studied earlier when we looked at Esau and Jacob when they sold the birthright. You remember that? Didn't Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, tell us that Esau despised his birthright? And that's proven by the fact that he sold it for so little, he sold it for a bowl of stew. So why is he now so upset at the prospect of losing something that Scripture tells us he despised anyway? Well, let's take a second look at that passage. It was in Hebrews 12, chapter 12, verses 15 through 17, just three verses. Let me remind you of what it says, and let's take a second look at them now in light of the fact that we see Esau so upset here. Verse 15, the writer of Hebrews says, See to it. That no one comes short of the grace of God. Now, he's speaking here to a church of New Testament believers. So from our standpoint today, we can hear this as spoken to us. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. And by it, many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Now, we didn't cover the last verse there in the first reading last time we looked at this. So now we have something new to consider in light of the story. First, I want you to notice the context of these comments by the writer of Hebrews. The very first verse I read gives you that context. And context is a fancy word, I guess, for what is he talking about? What's his topic? Well, the writer here warns the church about the possibility that someone in our midst may have come short of the grace of God. Somebody in our midst might be someone who is short of the grace of God. An unbeliever. An unbeliever living in and participating among Christians in a church community of some kind. Is that even a possibility? Well, I'm living proof that it was a possibility because I spent an awful lot of time with my rear in a pew before I knew the Lord. So it's absolutely a possibility that our churches at any given moment might have someone in the room or in the community somewhere who has come short of the grace of God. And the writer says we have to be careful to watch for that. But here's the reason why, he says, because unbelievers amongst the believing element or amongst the church are a source of of bitterness and trouble within the body of believers. The context here is proven by the story of Esau. We've already seen Esau is an unbeliever. That's already been established in this passage and also in what we've studied in the book of Genesis itself. So here's a man in a family who is an unbeliever, a godless man he's called in Scripture. As a result, he is an example by this author as the kind of problem that comes when you have a community of God-fearing people, which is the Old Testament term for believer. You have the God-fearing family of Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob. But in their midst is a godless man. And he, because of that, has no shared understanding of spiritual issues. And so he is a bitter root causing trouble in that family. And the writer of Hebrews makes an analogy or comparison. He says, in the same way that that transpired, we could see a similar problem emerge in the body of Christ if we are content, and that's the issue here, if we are content to allow people who have come short of the grace of God to remain in that state. So it's not about kicking people out necessarily. It's about loving them to the point where grace takes hold. The goal is that they become a believer, not that they leave. But... If in knowing their heart to be an unbeliever, we still accept them as if they were one, we stand the risk of having within us the source of bitterness that unbelief will bring as their lives feel and look differently than those of a believer. 
as they see the suffering of their sin, as they experience what life comes when you live in the flesh, they will wonder, why me and not everyone else? Why is this not working? And they have a tendency then to cause trouble within the body by virtue of how they project their problems back into the fellowship. It's a problem with the church. It's a problem with the Bible. It's a problem with my parents. It's a problem with my pastor. No, the problem's in your heart. And if we aren't able to call that out and distinguish that in loving ways, there's the risk that the source of bitterness causes the rest to suffer with it. Now, let's look at the example of Esau and see how that's playing out. Esau here, if you remember, is the kind of person who differs in this respect. He does not have the faith that his family has. And look what he's already been seen to doing in the family. He's caused, obviously, tension and discord with his brother. He's been the source for his father to act in an unfair way, to be unrespectful of God's ways, God's desires. He's been disrespectful of his wife's word. He's been showing lack of honor for Jacob and Jacob's uh, role as the owner of the birthright. He's married two ungodly women who now are also a source of misery, we're told, for Isaac and Rebekah. And now he's becoming a source of bitterness in the transfer of the birthright. For now he's wailing and crying in the midst of this moment, demanding something from the father who God has already said should give it all to Jacob, which is where it's gone. Now, the second thing we note from this passage is that Esau's sale of the birthright was proof, according to this writer, that he was a godless man. Now, remember, the birthright normally in most families outside of Abraham's family would have meant merely a earthly inheritance. The birthright would have been the the right to have a double portion of dad's inheritance. But in Isaac's family, it gained this added importance. It now has the significance of including a spiritual promise from God. So when God spoke to Abraham and said, you're also going to have all these wonderful spiritual blessings in the eternal realm, that was a new addition to this inheritance that all families except Abraham lacked. At the point in our story that we are in now, Esau is clearly upset at the prospect of losing the birthright inheritance. But then on the basis of Hebrews, we've been told he despised his birthright. How do we reconcile these two? Well, based on Hebrews, we have to conclude that if his sale of a birthright was proof that he had no faith, then it must mean that the part that he despised was the part that only comes by faith. That is, he must have despised the spiritual eternal blessings that had attached to the family's inheritance, the thing God added to the equation when he gave Abraham the promises he gave. That part Esau despised, because it meant nothing to a man who had no faith in God's word. But he still wanted the earthly inheritance, the part that all flesh wants. And so at the moment when he's lost that, he's sorrowful for that loss. He despised the heavenly promises, which he sold casually But he must have concluded and expected there'd be some way around that sale. And when the day came, dad would favor him and he'd get his portion anyway. Here's the thing. You can't separate the inheritance. It was an all or none deal in the way God produced it in Abraham's life. Either you agreed with and understood the spiritual promises and therefore could inherit them by faith. And with that came some material blessing in the meantime. Or you forfeit it all. And that's what happened in this case. And now, as the full reality of the loss sets in, Esau's attitude changes. Now he's sorrowful. Now he's regretting. And that leads us to the third thing we learn from Hebrews. After Esau realized the Lord had intervened to hold him to the bargain, to ensure that Jacob got what he was supposed to get, now he shows that he's sorrowful. Esau wanted to repent, but there was no place found for repentance. Now, let's look at that very carefully, because that's often a verse that trips people up. It's important to look at the sentence structure in verse 17. First, it says this. Esau desired to inherit the blessing. Now, who does he want to seek it from? Who's he earnestly seeking it from? Isaac, his dad. He earnestly desired to inherit the blessing. He wanted dad to grant him something. Then it says Esau was rejected in his pursuit for the birthright. Who rejected his request? Isaac, Isaac said, I've got nothing for you. Isaac cannot bless Esau with the birthright because he no longer has one to give. It's gone. So then the writer follows in verse 17. He says, Esau found no room for repentance. Now, the writer is saying 
that Esau had no capacity, no room. You might want to add a word there to help it make more sense to you. No room in his heart for repentance. What would he have to have room in his heart to repent of? His unbelief in God's promises within the birthright. He had no capacity, no room in his heart to repent and therefore have saving faith. Here's a man who is godless. Just as the church acknowledged in the early days in the book of Acts, when it was evident that the Gentiles were coming into faith, the apostles had to come to grips with the prospect that, yes, God is granting repentance to the Gentiles also. They recognized that the repentance unto salvation is a step that God grants in the heart. It's not happening here. So what do we make of his sorrow? If he's not repentant in the way that we use the word spiritually speaking, then what is this sorrow? Well, it's simply the earthly sorrow that comes when you lose something you want. It happens every day, particularly if you have like three, four, five-year-olds around you. You know, when they don't get what they want, what do they do? They're sorrowful. Esau lacked a repentant heart, the repentance of his despising of God's promises, but he was certainly sorry he lost the material blessings. Now, look at how that sentence structure ends in verse 17. He says, as a result of his lack of repentance... Esau could not obtain what he desired, and that is, of course, the inheritance. So the writer ends the verse by saying that he, Esau, sought it with tears. What's he seeking again, of course? The birthright inheritance. So the proper way to interpret the verse is to say it this way. For you know that even afterwards, when Esau desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected by Isaac. For Esau had no repentant heart, though he sought the inheritance with tears. So putting it all together, the writer says Esau was a godless man. He was an immoral man. He was a root of bitterness in the family of God-fearing believers. He despised God's spiritual blessings and promises. And as a result of his unbelief, he was willing to part with the spiritual blessing for next to nothing, only to later be sorrowful that he also had to lose out on the earthly, material blessing that went with it. And when God stepped in and excluded Esau from any inheritance whatsoever, he cried tears of sorrow, but not tears of repentance. Paul reminds us of that difference very clearly in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. There is a sorrow that is natural, and there is one that is God-derived, and only one produces salvation. And therefore, Esau's lack of repentance and his lack of faith stood in his way. And now Jacob, because of faith and God's promises, God's choice, as we've already discovered, he's been blessed He will receive gladly not only the spiritual promises, but he gets the earthly inheritance that went with it because it's one birthright. This pattern is still at work in the world today. The world desires to have earthly wealth, don't they? We share that to some degree, and in some ways we probably share it to our own detriment, but the point is we all understand it. We all know what that's like. And the world will cry tears of sorrow when they lose their wealth. There's tears of sorrow in one form or another when they lose what they think they want. But in their desperation to obtain and hold on to something that is destined to burn and fail in the end anyway, they completely ignore, you could even say despise, the promises that are found only in the Word of God. So in the end, those in the world who chase after the earthly wealth of this world while ignoring the promises of God, they lose both, just like Esau. That's the lesson of Esau. There is no have one and lose the other. It is all or none in Scripture. Because they try to obtain what they cannot keep, they fail to gain what they cannot lose. The believer, on the other hand, you and I, by faith, we're called to leave behind the chase for the things of the world, to put aside a desire for what the world offers, and to rest in the promises of God. As a result, though, of that refocus, The Word of God promises that we will gain far more than whatever we put aside in this world. He's not saying, and don't hear this wrong, please. He's not saying that because we choose not to chase the world, He'll give it to us anyway. There's no promise like that in Scripture. That's the false prosperity gospel. What He is saying, though, is what you stand to gain in eternity will make what you threw away here pale 
by comparison. Jesus says it in two different places in Scripture so clearly. In Luke 18, in verse 28, Peter said, Behold, speaking to Jesus, he says, Behold, we have left our homes and followed you. Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. And then he says in Luke 9, 24, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. What can Isaac do now with a bitter, unrepentant son under these circumstances? The son that has come to represent for us a picture of how the world lives its life, seeking after the earthly, despising the godly, and in the end, losing it all. Well, look what he does in verse 35. He said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. And then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants. And with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now, as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me even also, O my father. So Esau lifted his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. And it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. You know, if I'm Esau at that point, I might say, you know, Dad, on second thought, don't bother with a blessing. Now, Isaac begins with a statement that's actually a half-truth. So Isaac says, your brother came, and here's the half-truth, your brother came deceitfully. Okay, that's true. We, we don't want to deny the reality of what Jacob did. He and Rebekah conspired to deceive their father. That is lying. And as we covered last week, that was the sin that they brought to the equation. But then the statement ignores the obvious truth, and here's where the lie kicks in. Jacob was led, or you might even argue, forced to be deceptive Because Esau and Isaac were themselves being deceptive and conspiring to scheme against them and take the birthright in the wrong way. So who's at fault first here? There's plenty of blame to spread around. If anyone should be accused of trickery, it would be these two men. Now, I am not excusing the behavior that Jacob brought to the equation. I've already established that was sin and he shouldn't have done it. But the point is, Isaac is speaking a falsehood here when he starts the conversation by saying, your brother came deceitfully and took away your blessing. No, he didn't. He came deceitfully to retain his blessing. For it was already his by right, by the sale. Now, do you know the story of the spies and Rahab, the harlot from the book of Joshua? I don't have time to relate it all to you here. But there's a moment in that story where deception is used to protect the spies of Israel. So the deception was a sin, but it was used to further God's purposes in the plan of Israel in that day. That's another example of what we're studying here, where God works through the sin of men, not to condone it. He's certainly not the author of it, but he works with what he has. And since we all have sin, he really has no choice except to work through sinful people. But in the course of that work, he brings about good purposes. It's the same here. Jacob's sin results in him paying a high price, which we'll learn next chapter. But he is yet still working the will of God in the process. Then in verse 26, Esau takes the accusation a step further. So Esau says, let's note the irony in Jacob's name here, Dad. Jacob, it can be translated supplanter. And so he says, yeah, you know what, Dad? He was named right after all. Came in and supplanted me, took my place. But you know, it's important to note in that statement, And in what follows, he's acknowledging the sale of the birthright. So lest we think that somehow that earlier sale was a trick, that somehow Jacob put a fast one over on Esau and he never realized what was actually happening, his own statements condemn him here and prove to us that Esau knew exactly what happened. But then he claims it was an unfair sale. Well, sure, now you think it's unfair because now you see the full penalty of it. 
He tries to rewrite history to portray himself as the victim when he did everything he did for reasons Scripture tells us. We should base our view here of Jacob on what Scripture says and not on the testimony of these two men, even though the testimony is in Scripture. You follow me? The overall testimony of Scripture is Jacob was the godly man who, because of the mistakes of his parents, particularly Isaac, found himself scheming to receive something he should have rights to anyway. Their testimony, though, is he's the bad guy, they're the victims. Don't let their false testimony confuse you concerning the biblical view of Jacob. Now Isaac then breaks the bad news to Esau. Son, there ain't nothing left. I gave him everything. I gave him rights over you. You will serve him. He'll be your master. And at this point, you notice Isaac is starting to cry himself at the end. The full measure of regret must be setting in because if he hadn't been so foolish as to give Jacob everything, thinking it was Esau, he might have something left to give to the man he wanted to bless in the first place. I suspect Isaac viewed Esau something like the way Israel later views Saul. You know the story of Saul and Israel's selecting of that king in the days when they demanded a king? They told God, we want Saul because he looks the part. He looks like the kind of guy that should lead us as king. And he makes us feel good about ourselves because in the eyes of all the other nations, they have powerful men leading them and we want the same thing for us. But he was not the man who would eventually be the good king for Israel. That was a different man that God himself chose who did not look the part. Similarly, that's Isaac's view of Esau right now. Esau is the man that Isaac could imagine being the powerful leader over his family, unlike that weak boy Jacob. So he went with what his eyes wanted and what his flesh wanted, and he set aside what God wanted. And now Isaac has to break the news to Esau that because of his mistake, Esau is left out in the cold. So he asks rhetorically, what can I give you? I've got nothing. So then Esau asks in desperation, well, did you only have one blessing? You can only say blessings one time, Dad. Don't you have something else you can say? But unlike godless Esau, Isaac is God-fearing. So after God woke him up with this moment, caused him to tremble in fear of God, now as he speaks, he speaks fully mindful that he is going to act in the will of God. He is not going to tempt fate twice by trying to pronounce something that God won't allow. So what does he do in this new blessing? Having seen God's fingerprints over the whole episode, he now says what he knows is in God's heart for Esau. He confirms that Esau has been forsaken by the Lord, passed over, not chosen, not blessed. And he then gives a series of, quote, blessings, and I'm using that term ironically, which all become contrary statements to what was said to Jacob. So in the way that he spoke to Jacob, he chose to say the opposite in every case to Esau, which he would have to do in light of God's will. It says Esau will be separated from the fertility of the land and from the grace and mercy of heaven. Esau will be a people that live by the sword in keeping with the fact that he's a hunter. He will serve Jacob, except that Esau's people will be in constant rebellion to Jacob's people. That's the reference there to breaking the yoke. Even though there will be a servant-master relationship between these two people, the servants, the people of Esau, the people we come to know as Edomites, they will not be content in that situation. And there will be constant struggle, constant conflict. What's the purpose in that conflict? It assures that these two families will never have affinity for one another in all history. God will keep the purity of the people of Israel separate and distinct from the godlessness of the line of Esau, just as he did in the difference between Isaac and Ishmael. Separation. God's people called out from amongst those in the world who do not know the Lord. Historically, this is what we see happening from this point forward. This is historically an accurate blessing. The Edomites were always Israel's enemies, and any time Israel managed to conquer them for any length of time, inevitably the Edomites would rise up again and cause strife and rebel. Eventually the Edomites become a people called the Idumeans or Idumeans. And you may recognize that name because that's the family name of the Herod dynasty. The kings of Jesus' time, the Herods, came out of the Idumeans. They were Edomites. But when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 66 by the Romans, in the course of that destruction, they wiped out all remnant of the Edomites or the Idumeans, and that's when they ceased to exist as a people. There is a deeper spiritual truth here, though, that I want to end with. This blessing on Esau, this, quote, blessing that Esau gets, 
is also a confirmation of God's eternal decree, which he said in the fall in the garden. Because God said this. He said that the seed of woman would have enmity with the seed of the serpent. Now, the seed of woman is first and foremost Christ, the Messiah, born of a virgin. But it also represents in the seed all those who come in faith from that Christ. And that is an eternal struggle with Satan and all those who are born and remain sons of disobedience. So see, it is two camps, each of them with their respective head, Christ, Satan, believers, unbelievers. And in the garden, God says, because of the fall and because of the ramifications of the fall, I'm going to put enmity. I'm going to put an inability for these two worlds to find any harmony or anything in common. And I will ensure that that enmity goes on forever because I do not want these two worlds to ever mix. And even on a scale of two brothers in one family, the truth is being shown. That for Esau, the blessing would be away from your brothers, away from God's grace, away from the fertility of the land, and in constant conflict with your brother. God declared in the garden that there will always be enmity, and he's playing it out now. When Christ comes and when the kingdom is set up on earth, we're told in Old Testament prophets that Edom will become an uninhabited land, a memorial to what God has done in emptying out the unbelievers of the world and reserving the kingdom for the believers. And only then will the full measure of these promises come into being. Thank you, Father, for promises. Thank you, Father, for the word that conveys those promises. Thank you for the gift of faith that we may believe in those promises. And thank you, Father, for a place where we can be equipped to share that belief with others. Father, don't let us be content at the prospect that there would be among us those who have fallen short of the grace of God, but rather turn our hearts toward them in love and in acceptance and in a desire, Father, to bring them the message of the gospel by our lives as well as our words. But also, Father, give us a heart to discern and and to guard against any root of bitterness, any source of discord in our fellowship, knowing that you have said it from the beginning, Father, that there would be enmity between the seed of those who have been born in disbelief, as we all were, and those who have been reborn by the seed of Christ, Father, knowing that that enmity is purposeful and it is serving a good that you have designed, let us respect it even as we try to bridge it with the gospel. It's a delicate balance, Father. We are not capable in our own might and our own wisdom of carrying it out well. We depend on you and the Spirit to know that. We ask only, Father, that you give us a heart to obey, a heart for people, a heart for the gospel, a heart to serve, a heart of Christ, Father. And thank you for this day to respect and honor the fathers that we have on earth. Let us do that today to honor them as we should. And send us out from here, Father, with a a renewed emphasis on living the life that you've given us in Christ so that we may bring others with us next week, if that be your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.